Hi, this is Dr. Claire, and this is our lecture on animal diversity and the phylogenetic relationships between different groups of animals. All right, so we're going to start with um, the common ancestor of all animals. The common ancestor of all animals was some sort of protist, and it probably resembled this little cr creature here, which is called a coenoflagellate. Um, coenoflagellates are sing single cellular creatures, and um, they, but they do group up to form colonies where they live together, all right? Um, and so what we think happened is that some creature that was kind of like a coenoflagellate that was forming these colonies, um, certain cells within those colonies began to become specialized, and there was the evolution of multicellularity in the ancestor of animals, and um, so some, some of these different cells became, function, uh, became specialized for movement and reproduction and nutrition, and so you got this evolution of uh, more complex multicellularity like we've talked about before. So what we think these uh, these coenoflagellates probably evolved into was something like this, something like a sponge. Um, so you may be thinking this little coenoflagellate doesn't look very much like an animal, but if you look at a sponge, some of the cells within the sponge look very much like living coenoflagellates today. We call them coenocytes. Um, and their function within the larger sponge is to beat the water with flagella and um, that draws water in through the pores on the side of the animal so that the animal can filter feed and get nutrition out of the water. And so you have the, the coenocytes, which are filter feeding. You have little amoeba-like cells that are grabbing things out of the water. You've got kind of ex uh, extracellular cells that are kind of acting like skin. Um, there's little spicules, which are produced by some cells that are acting kind of like a skeleton. So all of that is happening um, in these animals. Um, but these, these cells, although they live together and they do form these larger organisms, um, they're more independent than many other animal cells. You can take a sponge and you can put it in a blender and blend it up so all the cells come apart and then pour that into some salt water and the sponge will actually, the sponge cells will actually find each other and build themselves back into a sponge again. So sponges are pretty weird um, and they're the, at the root of the animal tree. So if you look at uh, the family tree of animals. So here's our coenoflagellates. They're in blue because they're not an animal. They are a protist. Um, but we have this evolution of multicellularity that happens here. And there's our sponges. So they're the, at the base of the tree. Okay, uh, Pretty different from a lot of the other animals. So the next step is the evolution of tissues. Um, so sponges have specialized cells, but they don't have specialized tissues. So animals that have specialized tissues can be divided into two groups, the cnidarians and the bilaterians. Um, these uh, animals have specialized tissues. Um, the cnidarians have only two types of specialized of embryonic tissues. They're diploblastic, whereas the bilaterians have three types of embryonic tissues. They are triploblastic. So let's take a closer look at the cnidarians. Um, the cnidarians are the jellyfishes, anemones, and corals, as well as the hydrozoans, which you might not have heard of. Um, they have radial symmetry. Um, they are diploblastic, meaning they only have two embryonic tissue layers. They tend to have a gastrovascular sac rather than a full digestive system. So they're a, a pretty unique creature as well, um, and, but very cool. All right. Um, now, the bilaterians or the bilateral animals can be divided into three groups. Um, bilateral animals, of course, have bilateral symmetry. Um, they are triploblastic. They have three tissue types. Uh, embryonic tissue types. Um, and then they can be divided into the lophotrochozoans and the ecdysozoans, as well as the deuterostomes. Now, the lophotrochozoans and the ecdysozoans are both protostomes. Now, remember, a protostome is an animal where the blastopore, the first opening to the digestive system, forms the mouth. The deuterostomes are deuterostomes. Deuterostomes are uh, animals where the first opening to the digestive system forms the anus. Okay, so let's take a closer look at some of these groups. So the lophotrochozoans um, have is a, has a lot of diversity. I'm only going to ask you guys to know about two major groups within the lophotrochozoans. Those two groups are the annelid worms and the mollusks. Okay, so the annelid worms are the segmented worms. The the uh, the group is called the annelida. Um, the segmented worms include earthworms, as well as leeches and uh, polychaete worms, um, any worm where you can see distinct segmented lines on the animal. Um, I have a lot of experience with leeches. My field site in Australia had land leeches. If you've never heard of these guys before, they're kind of creepy. They don't live in the water. They live on land. 
and they're bloodsuckers and they're heat seeking. So you are standing in the forest and you look down and there are leeches on the ground of the forest and they're coming for you because they can sense your heat. They're very creepy. Actually, they're my favorite blood sucking parasite though because they don't carry any diseases. They don't buzz around your face and their bites don't really hurt. Um, they've got a, a, an anesthetic in their saliva so you don't really even feel it when they bite you. So as blood sucking parasites go, they're actually not that bad. Um, all right, so those are the annelid worms. Um, the mollusks, uh, mollusca is the group, um, include the, um, the bivalves, so clams, mussels, oysters, anything with two shells that close like this. Um, the gastropods, which are your snails, slugs, things of that nature, and the cephalopods. The cephalopods are your squid, octopus, nautilus. Um, cephalopods are super cute, cool, and cute, actually. They're cute and cool. Um, the octopus uh, is one of the few uh, invertebrates that can learn by watching other octopi. They're incredibly intelligent. They're, they're, they're really an uh, interesting critter. All right, so those are the, the lo lofo lophotrochozoans. The ecdysozoans, um, again, two groups I want you to know, the nematodes and the arthropods. Um, the nematodes are the round worms. Um, some of them are parasitic, but um, many are, they form uh, important parts of the, of the ecology. They're uh, detritivores, they eat det uh, deteriorating uh, plant material and fungus and bacteria and stuff like that. Um, in any given quarter cup of soil, there's probably a few million um, nematodes. They're extreme, they're tiny, they're microscopic little worms. They're extremely prevalent in the soil. They're really important for soil formation. Um, but there are some that are more harmful. There are roundworms that can cause disease. For example, a uh, heartworm in your dog is caused by a type of roundworm. Okay. Um, and then the arthropods. Arthropods are one of the most diverse, noticeable groups. Um, I mean, the nematodes are extremely diverse, but you don't see them very much because they're mostly in the soil or living inside of another animal. But arthropods, those are going to be your insects, your spiders, your um, crabs, lobsters, shrimps, centipedes, millipedes, anything that's kind of crunchy on the outside. The crunchy exoskeleton is a distinguishing feature of the arthropods. And they have those segmented legs and segmented bodies that allow them to move around and have allowed them to adapt to a lot of different environments. So they're, uh, they have uh, filled a, a wide variety of niches. They're actually an extremely successful group. All right. Um, so let's, let's uh, now go on to the deuterostome tree. Within the deuterostome, again, uh, two groups I want you to know. I want you to know the echinoderms and the chordates. Um, so we'll start with the echinoderms. Uh, here's, here's some uh, examples of echinoderms. So echinoderms include um, so starfish, although uh, marine biologists prefer you to call them sea stars because they are not fish and marine biologists get uptight about these things. So uh, sea stars. Uh, brittle stars, sun stars, sea cucumbers, and sea urchins. Um, these animals are kind of interesting because uh, unlike um, many of the other uh, bilaterians, they appear to have radial symmetry rather than bilateral symmetry. But it turns out that they are almost radially symmetrical, but not quite. They have a little um, organ called a sieve plate, which is the entryway to their vascular system. And um, that sieve plate, they only have one and it's off center. So you can't divide, you have to divide them through the sieve plate. So really there's only a one plane in which you can divide them where you actually divide them through that sieve plate, All, even though they do appear to be radi radially symmetrical. Um, but again, very cool th critters. Um, in addition to being deuterostomes, they also have um, a calcium-based skeleton, an endoskeleton, skeleton inside the body. Unlike the exoskeleton of the crunchy arthropods, the skeleton is inside the body and it's made of calcium rather than being made of chitin like an insect skeleton. Who else has a calcium-based en endoskeleton? We do. Um, so this is one of the ways you can tell that an echinoderm is closely related to us and we are a chordate. Um, so the vertebrates are within the chordates. Uh, vertebrates are anything that have a spine, but there are other things in the chordates as well. Sea squirts, which are these little sac-like things that look kind of like a sponge, but they're not. Um, as well as uh, the cephalochordates, which don't actually have a backbone, but kind of look like little fishes. Um, all of those are within the phylum chordata, which is the phylum to which we belong as well. Okay, we are deuterostomes, we are triploblastic, uh, we have bilateral symmetry, all of those things that are um, unique to our group. Okay, so, but I think that it is interesting to drive home that if you are trying to compare what is the uh, most closely related thing, 
on this planet that is not a chordate to us, it's actually echinoderms, which is kind of crazy. So uh, that's your closest relative that you're looking at right there. Okay, um, catch you guys later.